Hey there, and welcome to the first recorded video lecture of Math 344, Linear Algebra. We're going to talk about some material in section 1.2, vector spaces. You can see I've got two objectives for the lecture there. The first one is I want to know what the definition of a vector space over a field F is, give a careful definition of it. Uh, and then I want to just focus in this lecture on one example, that is the vector space of n tuples over that field. All right, I'm not going to cover in this video or in class uh, the material from section 1.1. I want you to read that carefully. I'm going to assign some homework problems out of it, but I'm assuming that you basically know that material from your experience in uh, either Calc 3 or the lower division linear algebra class. All right, so section 1.1 is important. It establishes some notation in the book, some terminology, and, and will remind you and give you a chance to review what you already know about vector spaces. Okay, if you're not familiar with what I mean by a field, when I'm talking about a field in this lecture, you can, for the purposes of this lecture, just always assume that I'm talking about the real numbers uh, or uh, the complex numbers, if you prefer. So, so but I'm going to just mention this thing as a field. Okay, so, so uh, we can talk about it in the in-class session, but if you're not familiar with field, again, just every time I say field, think the set of real numbers with the usual addition and multiplication of real numbers. All right, so let's motivate this notion of vector space uh, uh, by reviewing. This is kind of what you'll see when you review section 1.1 on your own. You first met the notion of a vector space in calculus. Uh, uh, you did your calculus in what you probably called the xy plane. I'm going to denote it here by r with a superscript 2 because elements of it, which I'm denoting by v, drawing a little bar over them like, uh, like you would in vector calculus, it's called r2 because elements of it are defined by two real numbers, v1 and v2 in this case I'm using notation. So v1 and v2 are two real numbers and r2 is the set of all two tuples or just ordered pairs. Yeah, And you saw in calculus that you can, and we call these things vectors, and you saw in calculus that we can add vectors. There's an operation called vector addition where you just simply add their coordinates. If I take some vector v, uh, its coordinates are v1 and v2, and I take some other vector w, it also has coordinates w1 and w2, then their sum v plus w is the vector whose coordinates are, well, you just add the x-coordinates, v1 and w1, that's how you get the x-coordinate of their sum. You add the y-coordinates, v2 and w2, that's how you get the y-coordinate of their sum. That operation is called vector addition. In function notation, I'm writing that like this. Uh, I'm just saying that if I take an element of r2, say v, and combine it with another element of r2, say w, I produce an element of r2 called v plus w. Okay, so that's just function notation for this operation, vector addition. Uh, you saw in calculus there's a second operation on vectors, although it doesn't take two vectors and produce a vector like our vector addition does. It takes a number, in, in linear algebra numbers are usually called scalars, so it takes a real number in this case, uh, in general, uh, it'll be an, any element of our field, and it combines that real number with a vector. So I'm writing, it takes something in R and something in R2 and produces something in R2. And here's the recipe. If the real number is called alpha, I like to denote scalars in linear algebra by Greek letters, then the vector alpha V, the scalar multiple of V, well, you just multiply V's first coordinate by alpha and V's second coordinate by alpha. Uh, that makes sense because alpha and v1 are real numbers. You can take the product of two real numbers. I'm showing you in the picture kind of a geometric recipe for what this v plus w is. It's called the, the parallelogram law. All right, so, so just to kind of motivate it one last time, in calculus, not just in R2, you also did it in R3, you learned how to uh, algebraically manipulate vectors by adding them together and scaling them by real numbers. Okay, so what we're basically going to do here is sort of abstract that definition or those properties. There are many objects in mathematics, not just pairs of real numbers, but many objects in mathematics, matrices, functions, polynomial expressions, lots and lots of objects in mathematics that have these analogous operations, ways to add them, ways to scale them. And they have the same properties that you're used to from your experience in Calc 3 or Math 241. So, so the abstract notion of vector space is sort of saying, well, why don't we just study any set with those operations that have those properties? Because then we kind of learn something about all possible examples at the same time. All right, so that's our motivation. So let's take a look at the definition. 
So this is our formal definition of what I'm going to be calling a vector space over a field. Again, if the word field is not familiar to you, you can just substitute in real numbers if you like. Okay, so, so, so just take the set F here just denotes the, the set of real numbers. And anytime I'm adding or multiplying in that set F, you can just think while well, I'm adding or multiplying real numbers. If you've had an abstract algebra course, our Math 343 course, then you can continue with me and just work over this, this notion of abstract field. For the most part in this course, when we do any kind of explicit computations, the field will usually be the field of real numbers, occasionally the field of complex numbers. Okay. okay, so what's a vector space? It's a set, V. I'm going to denote the set by V, phonetically for vector. Uh, it's a, so it's a set V to, and, 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 a, and a field F. And then we have two operations. Two operations. One of them is called vector addition. Okay, the first operation is called vector addition. And the function notation tells you sort of what its inputs are. I take a vector and another vector. Okay, and the combination of them produces a vector. So I'm just writing that over here. If x and y denote my two vectors, my elements of v, uh, uh, this, this arrow just indicates how I'm indi out in indicating the output of that function. So, so the, the spirit of this operation is that if you give me two vectors, x and y, there's something called x plus y that's also a vector. Okay, and that operation is called vector addition. Similarly, if you give me a scalar alpha and a vector x, uh, there's an operation which I'll just denote by alpha x that gives me some vector, okay? So, so the combination of a scalar and a vector by, via this scalar multiplication is, is, is a vector, okay? And now these two operations have to satisfy, well, there's a total of eight axioms, eight properties. These axioms are going to look very familiar if you're thinking about our guiding example, our R2. But we're going to look at, we have eight axioms that we're going to require that these operations satisfy. Uh, instead of quantifying it over and over and over again in each one of the eight lines, I'm just going to do it once here, okay? So I'm going to take for, for any x, y, and z in v, so I'm quantifying those things universally, and for any alpha and beta in my field f. Okay, so, so those are the quantifiers that are holding for every statement that I'm making below. So what are these eight axioms? Let me just scroll down. I won't try to reveal them one at a time. So the first vector space axiom, I'm using the same enumeration as, as in your book. The first vector space axiom is that the vector sum of x and y and the vector sum of y and x are the same. Okay, so x plus y is always the same as y plus x. If you like some vocabulary, that's called the commutative property. So this vector addition we're requiring to be commutative. All right. The second vector space axiom is that the vector operation of addition is associative. Associative means that when you group x plus y plus z, it doesn't matter how you group them. You can first group x and y and then add z to that, or you can first add y and z and then add x to that, and you'll get the same thing. That's called the associativity property. Uh, the third vector space axiom says that there's a special element of v. It's denoted by the symbol zero. Uh, we'll call it the zero vector. And that zero vector has the property that when you combine it with vector addition with any other vector x, you get that vector x back. Uh, uh, the operation is commutative, so what I've written here is a little vestigial, but you can combine it in either way. So there's a special element called zero, the additive identity for the zero vector that, that sums with any vector to give that vector x back. Okay, the fourth vector space axiom is that every vector x, there's another one, I'm just denoting it by y here. Actually, I think I'm gonna switch the notation uh, on the fly here and say uh, for every vector x, there's some other vector. Let me just call it x prime for a second, okay? And what does that x prime do? When you add it to x, you get zero. So it's sort of like the opposite of x, yeah? So, so most of the time we'll just denote x prime by negative x. It's the opposite vector. It's something you can add to x and get zero. And I'm going to just pause here before looking at the, the last four axioms and say to you abstract algebra veterans, you students that have had Math 343, these first four axioms just say that the set V with this operation of vector addition is an abelian group. Yeah, it's an abelian group. It's abelian because of the commutativity property. And then we have an associativity, we have identity, and we have inverse. So these first four axioms, if, if 
Math 343 were a prereq for this course, I could just say, well, a vector space is an abelian group, V, uh, denoting the additive identity by zero. Okay, and then these other axioms, five, six, and seven, kind of say how the, the scalar multiplication interacts with this abelian group. All right, so the fifth one is just saying that if you take the scalar one, every field has a multiplicative identity, just like the number one and the real and complex numbers. And if you scale a vector with that number one, you get the vector back. So that's called the multiplicative identity. Uh, and then six, seven, and eight are sort of things, again, if you're thinking about your experience in Calc 2, they're, they're things that are, that are very clear about how these vectors work. But just to say uh, what they mean, if you take two scalars, two scalars can be multiplied together to get a scalar, right? The product of two real numbers is a real number. So this sixth axiom is just saying if you multiply alpha and beta together and then scale the vector x with that result, you would get the same thing as scaling the vector x by beta and then scaling that by alpha. So it looks like another form of associativity, in some sense it is. Uh, likewise, if you add vectors x and y together and then scale them by alpha, you get the same thing as if you scaled x and y separately by alpha and then added those together. Kind of looks like a distributive law, and vice versa. If you add the two scalars together, that's some scalar, and if you scale x by that scalar, you could have scaled x by alpha and beta separately and added them together. All right, so we've already said this, but we'll always call elements of the set V vectors, and the elements of the field are, are called scalars, all right? So any set V together with uh, two operations, V cross V to V and F cross V to V that satisfy these eight axioms, we'll call a vector space over the field F, okay? And, it, and it's basically our subject this semester in Math 344 is to carefully study these vector spaces any set that has this, these operations that satisfy these properties. It's a very important uh, subject in mathematics, and there are very many important examples that satisfy these. All right, in this particular video lecture, we're just gonna look at one example. This next part of my lecture notes is to just set up some notation. So if you take a bunch of elements of your field, if you take a bunch of scalars, say A1, A2, up to AN, and you write them as a group like this, enclosing them in parentheses, let me just denote, I'm using the same notation as the book. Uh, alphabetically, I don't really like it all that much, but let U be a shorthand for this list, A1 to AN. Such an expression is called an n-tuple. All right, uh, uh, our guiding example, R2, we, we called it a two-tuple, but a two-tuple people usually just say ordered pairs but you can imagine a three tuple, four tuple, any number of numbers. So, so it's an ordered list of numbers, it's called an n-tuple. Uh, the, the, the entries in the n-tuple come from f, so it's called an n-tuple with entries in f, okay? If you have another one, if v is say an n-tuple whose entries are called b, then u and v are the same n-tuple by definition if and only if they have the same entries. So u and v are the same if and only if a1 is the same as b1, and A2 is the same as B2, and, and so on, AN is the same as BN. They all have to be the same. So, so in, for two n-tuples to be the same, they have to have the same entries for every possible position. Uh, I'm going to denote by F to the N the set of all n-tuples. Okay, F to the N is the set of all n-tuples. If N is equal to 1, uh, uh, we typically simplify the notation and just write F for F1, and we won't write an n-tuple, we just write A instead of that, because the parentheses just sort of get a little bit busy. But F to the N is, is the set of all ordered n-tuples uh, uh, with entries in the set F, okay? Just like in our guiding example, yeah, in our guiding example, uh, the field F was R and the N was 2. The XY plane is just, just the set R2. In Calc 3, when you worked in Euclidean space, through three-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, you were working in R3, right? Set of ordered triples of, of real numbers. I'm going to define a couple of operations on the set of all n tuples, all right? So, so that I'm getting used to this function notation. I'm going to tell you a way to take two n tuples and produce an n tuple. And I want to tell you a way to take a scalar and an n tuple and produce an n tuple. Okay, and here are the definitions. So, so this is just the notation. U is my n-tuple with entries called a1 to an, v entries b1 to bn, and I've got a scalar called alpha. 
So by definition, u plus v is the n-tuple that you get. Well, you take the first coordinates of u and v and you add them together. That makes sense because a1 and b1 come from the field f. The field f has an addition operation in it and the sum of two elements of f is an element of f. So coordinate by coordinate, you just add the entries in the n-tuples. That produces an n-tuple with entries in f. Likewise, alpha u, scaling u by the vector alpha, or the, sorry, the scalar alpha, you take alpha and multiply it by each entry of u. Uh, alpha is an element of f, ai is an element of f, so their product is an element of f. So that also gives an n-tuple. And these things are called coordinate-wise, coordinate-wise because we're doing it for each one of the coordinates in the n-tuple, uh, uh, addition and scalar multiplication. All right, so if we don't say otherwise, on the set fn, that's always the operations of uh, vector addition and scalar multiplication, okay? And the fact, this is going to be the uh, only thing we kind of pseudo prove here in this first lecture, is that fn, together with those operations of coordinate wise addition and scalar multiplication, uh, uh, is a vector space over f. Okay, so what does it mean to give a proof of that? You can see I'm only going to give a partial proof. I'm not going to give the whole thing. But what it means to prove, and, and you're going to need to get used to this in your homework and throughout this course, proving some set together with specified operations of vector addition and scalar multiplication as a vector space means that you need to verify that each one of those eight axioms holds. Okay. So, so those eight axioms are quantified statements about properties that have to hold. So, so let's, let's try it out here. Let me, let me give a partial proof, partial in the sense that I'm only going to do a sum of the eight axioms and leave the rest to you. But, but uh, let me establish some notation in my proof. So I'm quantifying variables. So suppose I have two vectors, u and v, using the same notation as above. So, so those things, although I'm not writing it explicitly here, if I write u is an element of fn, it's implicit that a1, a2, that is the entries of the vector u are, are elements of f. Same with v. Uh, I'm going to have a third one here, w. Uh, call its entries c. Those are elements of fn. Uh, and then take a couple of scalars, alpha and beta and f. So how would we verify, say, the first vector space axiom? Well, we have an explicit definition for what we mean by u plus v. U plus V, by definition, is the vector whose coordinates are the sums of the coordinates of U and coordinates of V. But in the field F, let's just focus on this first entry. In the field F, A1 plus B1 is B1 plus A1, right? In the set of real numbers, addition is commutative. Addition is commutative in any field. If you want to review, I think it's Appendix C, if you want to review the, the general field axioms. But, but in a field, uh, the order of addition, it doesn't matter. Same thing in the second coordinate and so on. So when you get all done, you can swap all of those, and that's the exact same thing as V plus U. So, so that's our vector space axiom number one, that this vector addition is commutative. I'm going to leave associativity to U. That's where you'd need to use your W. But it'll boil down to the associativity of the entries where you're working in the field F. Vector space three, axiom three, says that there, there's a zero vector. There's a special vector. So you have to say what it is. Well, so I'm going to denote by zero. This is notationally a little dangerous, but, but in practice, it won't cause confusion. I'm going to denote by the symbol zero the n-tuple, all of whose entries are zero. Okay, I call this thing the zero vector. The zero vector is by definition the n-tuple, all of whose entries are the zero scalar, right? So, so it's an element of fn by definition. Each one of these entries, they're all the same, are elements of f. And if you take that zero vector and you add it to your arbitrary vector u, well, the definition is you add zero to all the coordinates of u. Well, of course, that just returns the coordinates of u back. So that's how you verify that third vector space axiom. Let's do one more. Uh, uh, given u, let's let this u prime denote the vector whose entries are the additive inverses of the entries of u. So, so the entry of u prime is minus a1, minus a2, and so on, minus a n. Yeah. If you take that u and u prime and add them together according to our recipe, well, a1 plus its opposite is zero, and same for a2 all the way up to a n. So u prime here is the additive inverse of u. 
Okay, the remaining axioms are, are all treated similarly. It basically boils down to, if you want to assume the field F is the field of real numbers, that's fine. It boils down to the field properties. It boils down to the, the way you multiply and add in a field. All right, so this is kind of our guiding example of a vector space. I'm gonna keep this first video lecture kind of short and leave it at that. Um, one more uh, a comment about these things, just notation-wise. When we write elements of Fn like this in a single line, sometimes they're called row vectors because we're keeping the entries of the vector u in a row. Occasionally, we'll switch notation and we'll write that vector u, instead of keep writing the elements in a single row, we'll write them in a single column with n rows. All right, so that's also just a different manifestation. I'll also think of that as an n-tuple, kind of written in a different way. And when we write it that way, I'll call it a column vector. Okay, so rows are things that are organized horizontally. Columns are things that are organized vertically. All right. So this vector space Fn, uh, we can write it, the elements of it as row vectors and column vectors. We'll see uh, examples of when we want to use each. All right, so that's gonna be it for this time. I'm gonna keep this video short. Next time we're gonna look at many examples of vector spaces. So thanks for listening.